One thing I would say about things that uh, in uh, my favourite passage in, in Virgil and Peter is when Orwell, in beautifully uh, gratuitously style, complains about all the kids in Manchester who are uh, buying uh, several of suits on high purchase. Um, and he says, you know, you may be da da da, but you can still look like Clark Gable at the weekends. And so in 36, that consumer society was absolutely there, and people were borrowing heavily to buy the equivalent of Nike trainers then. And I think that, you know, in a way, when we're trying to work out, we're in a situation now where the model of capitalism that's existed for, you know, when the economists I was talking to the same thing is that uh, when Keynesianism collapsed, there was monetarism ready to take its place. Keynesianism had a 30 year cycle collapse. Now we've got monetarism that's reached the end of its 30 year cycle collapse. There's no set of ideas to take its place. So we have an opportunity now to consider how we could rebuild a new model. We, could, we really do, because no one is talking about it. There's no, there's no, you can't find economists out there without a solution to this, particularly all economists. Uh, there are some ideas, books like National Capitalism, which talk about how uh, rebuilding sustainable capitalism, how your, your value in, you know, on, on the balance book of a company, uh, you know, uh, natural resources don't have any actual value. They, but if you, if you start to, to value the resources that a company uses and then put those onto the balance sheet, <coughs> you can start to view how a company measures its performance in terms of the uh, natural materials it uses. So and we're in a position now where there's such despair, there's such chaos, and there's so many ideas that, that aren't being had that we can start to talk about that. But I think, I think because if you look at 36, people still want to buy several of those things then, I mean, but framing that argument by saying we shouldn't have those things, and probably, in a way, you can say the thing about the iPhone is that 75% uh, uh, of the iPhones, uh, the money you pay for an iPhone, goes into Apple's bank account. It doesn't pay for anything. It just goes into this 65 billion that they're gradually amassing for no good reason at all. You know, there's no obvious reason, no set sense of what they're going to do with that 65 billion, but it's just there. 75% of it is profit margin on, on, on the iPhone. So one way you can do it is you can Pay, uh, how much it costs to make an iPhone will we'll pay that. And then you start to see that the, the, the value uh, starts to reach out with paying the issue. If you look at the, the, the household debt now in the UK and you look at what would have happened if uh, wages had continued to increase at a reasonable rate, and benefits had continued to increase as opposed to freezing as they really had, really what's happened is we have made up the difference. It's not like we've, we've stayed at a level and, and you know, we're, we're basically trying to live the way we lived 20 years ago, but we can't because the money is not being, it's not being, and it's not being given because money doesn't exist. As we can see, 65 billion exists on Apple Bank. It's just, it's been sexualized to an immense degree. Danny Dawling, a great, great, great book by Danny Dawling about inequality. One of the things he points out is that um, the gap between rich and poor now, um, we've gone past 1936. Well, in in other words, the gap between rich and poor is huge. But we're now going back towards 1911 in terms of the actual gap between the, the wealthy and the, and, and the poor in the case. So we need to work out how we uh, deal with this and how we deal with social mobility. One really obvious thing to do is close private schools. I mean, it's really, really obvious. If you close private schools, we all go to the schools we have to worry about. So people don't go to private schools in Oxbridge and they go to PPE department, they go to the same schools as everybody else. And so I think it's, it, it's, it's not even being considered, it's not part of the political debate. And I, was, I think it was Richmond's district festival event where a bloke went to a private school and said, the end of the day, I thought, I'm 46 years old, I've never had that thought. I've never thought to myself, let's close the private schools. And it's really obvious, it's really simple. 25% of the money to 7% of the schools. And it's set like this. It's close. Should we have some final questions? Uh, any more after this gentleman? Okay. Right, um, targeting um, people who need help, governments have found it very difficult to serve charities. So, can I just ask a question about food banks and food parcels as an example? I gather that sometimes they get recommended, families get recommended for a food parcel in effect from something like CAB. That's a very small number of people actually going to CAP and ask, if you like, for help. So are, are there any better ways of targeting the right group? In other words, you capture the right people. So do we have any more questions? Does anyone have anything else they want to ask our panel tonight? Okay, well I think we'll, that's, that's where we're going to draw our conclusion. Anyone like to... I mean, the one thing I'd say about food banks is that 99% of the food banks in the UK are, are a food bank organisation called the Trust the Trust, which is a uh, thoroughly respectable organisation. It does very, very good work. But it is a, it is a Christian organisation with a particular um, set of ideas, and it will only accept vouchers from people.
people who have been recommended to the food bank by a doctor, by some of the supervised bureau and whatever, because they want to make sure that they're not giving the food to the wrong sort of people. They want to make sure that the people are in some way correct for the receiving of the, of the food parcel. So what you have is you have the, the screening of people who are eligible for food parcels. It's been conducted really by an organisation who have about five people in Salisbury who determine the policy for in Coventry last year, there was something like 7,000 families who received food parcels. That's for five people in Salisbury, just something for the whole of the UK. So we're in a situation where working out who and how people get that free food is, is, is something that needs to be democratised rapidly. It really needs to come out of the hands of that organisation. Not because that organisation is equal, but because it's not appropriate for the small group of people that are determining that. And that's maybe one of the other big problems, is, 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 is that idea of the elite doing right answers. You know, there's a great book by James Rich called The Wisdom of Crowds, which shows that if a small group of people make a decision, it's almost invariably wrong. Whereas if a whole group of people make a decision, it's almost right. Yeah, can I, I, just, to, just to follow on from that, we, we support 250 families a year. And uh, uh, it's quite right, we have, we're given, I think, about 30 food vouchers. And we then have to decide which of the families that we're supporting are most in need and get those vouchers. So we know uh, we go into the homes and, and we know the, the situations, but it, it's, it's really difficult for us and it's agonising for us to decide which of those families are going to get those precious vouchers because after we've given them out, there's no more, more to give. There's no end of families who need those food vouchers. So finding them isn't really difficult because they come to us and other charities asking for that help. So, you know, targeting them isn't the problem, is there are not enough vouchers to go around and I, I think I agree with what Stephen saying that we don't really, we shouldn't have to do that, you know, ration uh, voucher, food vouchers, we shouldn't have to make those decisions. Okay, well, um, thank you all for joining us today and thank you again to Richard, I know he said that he'd love it if everyone stuck around for a drink, he didn't want you to all rush off and um, thank you again to Lecture Festival for having us in this beautiful room and um, Thanks for being a great, enthusiastic audience.